So we'll probably linger on this slide while I give you a preamble. Um, I grew up without a television, and so I had a lot of time to amuse myself with my sister. And um, my father, he subscribed to this weekly magazine publication called World of Warcraft, which was military hardware. And my mum, in complete um, opposition, just subscribed to Busy Needles. <laughs> as a statement of, let's create something, instead of just worship tanks and <laughs> bombers and whatever. So we have a complete library of these craft magazines. And so we would just <coughs> dip into there and just get cracking with whatever. And um, so there's a real can-do spirit to um, with me and craft. So, I went to art school and did sculpture and printmaking and um, and then I was a bike messenger for a while and then I really missed making things and I enrolled in uh, apparel which was design and making and thought that I'd enrolled in that full time but it turned out I'd enrolled in footwear full time and <laughs> apparel part time but the footwear really... Um, played into that sense of sculpture that I'd done at art school and it was a functional sculpture because you know the idea of making sculptures for a living was really, you know, the works were so personal, how could I possibly sell them? And the irony is now that I'm married to a sculptor and that's exactly what he does for a living. And um, <laughs> so shoe making, I just felt this real affinity with it and it's gonna sound a bit kind of twee, but just that lineage of makers over time it's the oldest guild in the UK, the Cordwainers Guild. So um, there was just this sense of like connection to, you know, past craftspeople, and and also because it was a really masculine craft, like no ladies were allowed to, to do it. And I saw I'm just a total rebel and thought stuff like that. But um, even when I moved to, I um, uh, so I studied in Adelaide. Good town craft people, and um, there are no real shoe making opportunities there. So I moved to Sydney and started making in a workshop there. And it was just all the whole industry was closing down, and it was a really bad time. Um, Melbourne was the last vestige of uh, shoe making factories, but also workshops and more high end creative work, which is where I ended up. So um, I did that making production footwear for a long time, which was a lot of repetition, which is a great way to learn a skill by just doing it over and over and over. But um, the commercial nature of making work that way, I felt really stifled the, um, the where you could take it. So I started going further. Um, uh, I'm a very more is more person. I'm not a minimalist. And uh, so I, and I'm being a lover of old school craft magazines and wanting to bring that from the dusty bookshelf into the world with a fresh perspective, I uh, started making um, works that combine the two. And it's only from really looking back, I can see that I've just been framing textiles with leather, essentially, this is what I've been doing. So um, this is my absolute favorite color scheme. Um, I should probably have been in Napoleon's army or something like that. And I literally wrote these while watching the Tour de France in 2005. And um, yes, the annoying thing about shoes is that they come in pairs, so you need to do what you need to do it again, and hopefully it matches. And um, I've also had this peculiar um, obsession with making sneakers growing up as a bike messenger, listening to hip hop, just being really into that cultural phenomenon and no one was doing sneakers by hand. And one of my teachers, he figured it out and so yeah, I just went for it. And um, I made these in 2005 and they're still one of the cleanest <laughs> pairs that I've ever made and especially because they're white and it's very difficult to keep clean. Oh, and they were also in, uh, the Flinders Quarter Award used to be around many moons ago, and um, so these got into that, uh, and um, these were uh, the next entry I did for the Blinders Quarter Award, which is um, the socks I learned to knit at RMIT 
um, on a knitting machine, you know, the good old sh 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 that everyone's kind of got under their bed but doesn't really use. Um, and then the, the fan on the front of the foot is made from a brocade that I got from Kazari out in um, Cremorne or what's it called, um, Church Street. And so I just, you know, made the pattern and, and, um, and that's, that's those. These guys are um, a cross stitch on an Ada cloth. Um, I, I'm not very good at free stitching. I like millimetres, I like grids. I like to have it all, you know, mathematically just so. And I'm, I'm really obsessed with millimetres. So um, I have to, yeah, this, this really is a bit of a, um, this did send me a little mad. Uh, because the strands were, it's just two strands of um, embroidery cotton and uh, yeah, times four. Um, the, the spats detach and it's just like a cute little Oxford shoe under there and the thread, I don't know if you can see from back there, but the thread on the front of the shoe is like a, a rainbow thread that I got, so it's just matchy matchy. Um, I also do a lot of accessories because it's hard to make a living purely from theatrical style footwear. Um, I mean, I have day jobs and all, as many of us do. Um, and again, I'm framing something with leather. So I um, found a bag of stamps at an op shop and just thought, what am I going to do with those? And I just lined them all up in a row and made them into a belt. And I was doing postage stamp belts for a long time. But the format only really lends itself to landscape stamps. So the portrait stamps were going you know, they had no homes, so I decided to, to get them out because a lot of them are quite big. They're like, this, this one is a big square, so it's about, about that big. And um, so the idea of getting the stamps out of the stamp album and sending them off around the world again, it's really appealed to me. So I've been making these for a number of years and I've taken my own around the world a few times. These guys keep me uh, in some good coin because um, people who have babies don't buy them, but the friends of the people with the babies do. Um, they're, they're, really, um, they're really fiddly. I probably should get my daughter Hazel to help me make them because they're so <laughs> tiny and um, they're made of sheepskin, which is incredibly soft and very tactile, you just kind of want to rub it on your cheek and um, yeah, so I've been making these, well I started when my son was a baby and he's nearly 13 and so I just make them in new colourways each time and they, they make people squirrel and I think it's kind of funny. Um, this is um, machine embroidered so painstakingly. I. I traced off the design that a graffiti artist friend of mine had done, just on a bit of tracing paper, and I just stitched over it, essentially perforating it so that I could then pull the, the tracing paper out once it's done. Uh, these were in the um, first Victorian Craft Award that was a couple of years back, and um, uh, this next lot is. Um, it's kind of a project that's ongoing, which is the transformative power of a pair of kick-ass shoes and how you can really um, become a different character. And essentially, all, all of these shoes are for me, and they're all my size, of course. But um, keeping them for um, exhibition purposes is one thing, but then wearing them on an everyday basis is another thing. And um, these are embroidered. Um, I guess it's called a Florentine style, similar to the first pair. So it's just long up and down stitch, but the whole piece. And these were in, um, I think these won a prize at the show. But it was a tricky one because the tapestry were weaving versus needlepoint tapestry, and I had no idea what category these were meant to go in. And I rang many an esteemed crafty friend to get the low down, and I did get the right pattern in there but the distinction still needs to be made. And this is a recent pair that are in the Victorian Craft Award at Craft Victoria at the moment. <coughs> These panels are from old um, pencil cases 
And I just found a stash of them at an op shop and thought, choose, let's do. And, um, <laughs> and so this um, pair were made while I was, um, I did a residency at uh, Beck and Ramona from Handmade Life. They were here last year doing residency. And uh, they had a studio at the Queen Vic Market, which I inhabited last year. And, um, and so I made these there. Um, they're pretty awesome. And this next slide, it kind of makes me laugh now because I had this preconceived notion of what I could make. Yeah, I'm just going to casually go to the tapestry workshop and embroider this intense floral and weave it on the loom and it's going to be great. And then two, I've done two days of a workshop with Joy and she's just, she's just kind of shaking her head going <laughs> And because um, my footwear pattern pieces are irregular, so they're shaped, and Joy's just like, oh, you want to make shaped pieces. Oh. <laughs> so I, and, and as she predicted last night, I woke up in the middle of the night with just all these ideas and conundrums going through my head. So I've been vaguely inspired by the, the tiny little boot. The top is a, a Mongolian wrestler's boot, which the silhouette has just always appealed to me. Um, and so I was hoping to weave the boot tops um, and it's still to be. Um, Am I ignoring this? Yeah. Oh yeah, just oh, a little. Sorry. <laughs> um, I'm still hoping to weave the boot tops, but it's looking like I'll have to pare down my ambitious <laughs> ideas. I mean, I'd like I, I'd like to honour this technique that I've just, you know, spent two days doing, and um, <laughs> not really bodge it together. That I don't really like to do it that way, but. Pixelated florals is where I was starting, and I don't know if I'll end there, but, but that's that. And I'll be here for about six weeks part time, so feel free to come in and see what I'm up to. Cool, thanks. Any questions for Emma? No? Yeah, I have one. Two questions actually. Where is this option? And the second <laughs> 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 Is it Whitmore Square? Yeah, the southern. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Also, in, terms of, <laughs> <laughs> in terms of your practice, how how frequently are you motivated or inspired by just stuff that you have found in an op shop? You see it, pencil case, bunch of stamps, whatever. Well, it seems like a theme now that you talk about it. Um, <laughs> is that a regular thing, or is that a little bit unusual? And you're um, a more... I mean, it's probably it's probably regular. I mean, there's all sorts of gems at op shops, and there's all sorts of things people have discarded that mm, that are probably still very appealing to me, being a bower bird and being someone who appreciates techniques that were used widely in the past. Um, I mean. My work is a bit costumey, but it's a bit of an homage to a certain technique, but combined well, two techniques really combined with the shoemaking, um, because people can relate to embroidery a lot more than they can relate to shoemaking. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of yeah, yeah I, I'm kind of drawing in two two different. Um, it's, it's intriguing from multiple perspectives, I guess. But I'm always collecting things and. My husband is really not that keen on my stash, and the kids are both quarters, so <laughs> Sam has his own studio where he retreats to be in his Zen kind of piece. But um, yeah, I'm a magpie and I just have too much stuff. And, and the list of things to make is longer than the time I have to make them, which is quite disheartening. But opportunities like this, where you get to really work on something and really honour it and pour all that love into it and end up with something really special that you just couldn't make commercially because of the hours and materials and yeah but I, I just think it's so satisfying. <coughs> Is shoe making a viable <coughs> artisan work in Melbourne? You said you left Sydney because it wasn't but um, this <coughs> There are a few shoemakers. There are a few. They make standard men's brown shoes, which I'm allergic to. <laughs> and um, so, um, yeah, there's a few. There's one guy in Greville Street in Paran who's cornered that market. 
Wooten is his business name. <laughs> um, I mean, it's not really, but and you don't go into shoe making to earn a living. And, and the people I used to make shoes for in Fitzroy now get their stuff made in Bali, but they don't tell anyone, and they still charge the same price as if they were made in Fitzroy. And um, so that's a bit of a yeah, you know, who is it? That's what you want to know. Um, there's actually a few number two makers now who get their stuff made in Bali. So, oh, shame. Yeah, I think it is, and also because there is still a shoemaking course here in Brunswick, so the people who come out of that course can't get any work if everyone's making it offshore. Because you, you can go into business on your own, but you kind of, you know, there used to be the apprenticeship and it's a seven year apprenticeship and, um, and I kind of did that working in Sydney and Melbourne. I worked at Vegan Wares for a long time in their crazy basement with the Macedonians who said women shouldn't make shoes. And, um, <laughs> and then I worked at Preston's Lee in Fitzroy for a number of years. And, um, and then I had kids and then I just started you know, flexing my own muscles, so to speak, and just making really crazy things that I wasn't able to make for other people because, you know, you're driven by the dollar. Now you um, said that you make everything in one size, so... Well, I mean, these are... These just can't... I can't put a price on these, because the hours... I mean, shoemaking is like tailoring for the foot. Um, the hours are intense. There's, there's over, like, 150 techniques involved in making a quite elaborate pair of shoes, and so that... And, and I tried doing commercial work and turning it into a business, and it just killed my creativity. I had to dumb it down every single step of the way to make the price competitive, and it was, and I ended up making boring black shoes, and I just hated it, so. And galleries like the Powerhouse that collects a lot of fashion, have they purchased any of your work? No, they haven't. They, they have a very specific um, circle that they collect from, and, and I am not in that circle. Um, may happen one day. I, I do contact them and the NGV here, um, but they're putting the Bali, Balinese made stuff in at the NGV. So um, in the Melbourne made, in the, was it Melbourne Now exhibition? Mm -hmm. So it was, yeah. Were you in Melbourne Now? No, no, the Balinese stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but don't get me started. <laughs> Any more questions for Emma? Thanks, Emma. Thanks.